The title is uh, 3D Correlative Cryoimaging Using Super Resolution Fluorescence Microscopy and Soft X-ray Tomography. Um, my name, as I said, is Maria Hergeliak, and I'm the Principal Beamline Scientist of the Correlative Cryoimaging Beamline B24 at the UK Synchrotron Diamond Light Source. Um, diamond is, uh, uh, well, I have a picture of Diamond here, has a number of groups, uh, one of which is the Biological Cryoimaging, where we belong. So our data, our beamline, is uh, part of this group, along with EBIC, which is the UK National EM facility. And we you will find more information on our website about the technique. And this is the current team. We see myself, Chidima, Tom, and Elias, who are the beamline scientists you're likely to encounter if you ever visit the beamline. Okay, so I'll start by putting things into context. As we all know, when we're trying to understand a system, we need to collect information from the macro level or the whole organism, either imaging or other data, and then progress through tissue, cells, organelles, all the way to the fine details of proteins and atoms. Now, for each of these scales, there's different techniques that have been devel developed from CT, for example, imaging for whole organisms and tissue, all the way down to X-ray crystallography. And uh, Beamline B24 in specific uses fluorescence microscopy and soft X-ray tomography to image mostly cells, organelles, complexes, and tissue slices. So this is the area where we actually collect data. All right, so the, I'll start with uh, the first thing is what our samples are. So usually we look at cells or uh, biological material on TN grids. And these are uh, flat uh, gold three millimeter wafers where we actually grow cells on. Uh, they usually have a carbon film to provide support for the cells, or we can add samples, which can be cells, bacteria, uh, archaea, virus infected cells, cancer cells, the like, similar. Uh, or we can just deposit them on these grids. Fundamentally, what's not captured on this workflow is that the next step is we cryopreserve our samples. So we uh, flash freeze them with plunge freezing or high pressure freezing. And that way we preserve a, an instant in their life and uh, make sure that they can withstand the harsh imaging conditions that we use. Uh, we have fluorescence, as I said, and we have a workflow that involves fluorescence super resolution fluorescence microscopy and soft x-ray tomography. Now this happens by translating the same sample through all these microscopes. So uh, the information you collect at any given point is directly relatable. We also interface with other techniques such as electron tomography and other x-ray imaging modalities. And you can see snapshots of the fluorescence microscope and the x-ray microscope you, you'll see in a little bit. What we achieve in a nutshell is we can uh, combine information coming from x-rays, and this is this gray, which is the, this gray slice of information that you see, with fluorescence. In this case, it's the localization of uh, virus particles within vesicles within a cell. And this is a project I'll describe in a little bit. Okay, so in a nutshell, we build and design, design and build microscopes, but also we develop the technology that accompanies these microscopes and make sure that they're user accessible and user friendly. We help from all the way from design uh, experiment, uh, experiment design, all the way to protocols, expertise, data collection. And we're actually there to help with data collection and processing, initial processing, but we're also there to help with further analysis down the line. And uh, you can see our workflow again and typical examples of uh, data that I will show you in a little while also. This is how the beamline looks inside. And I will start first by introducing our workflow. I kind of mentioned it that in that we start from cell cultures, live cell imaging to see how the system is progressing, and then plunge freezing, initial verification that uh, our plunge frozen freezing has, uh, it was successful, and then either fluorescence, uh, soft X ray tomography, and then in silico data processing. So this is what we do in a nutshell. And I'll start with the uh, sample preparation. You'll notice I'm skipping the cell culture and live imaging. Uh, we kind of take it for granted that the groups that are interested to, in uh, pursuing this type of imaging have some basic facilities to grow cells and uh, assess them visually. Saying that, we have protocols and facilities that we can share with users even for those stages. So uh, again, plunge freezing I mentioned. Uh, what happens is, as I said, we grow cells in EMs on EM grids or 
uh, we deposit them on them. And you can see here one against a uh, five uh, P coin. Also, you can see it here with the inverted tweezers and a glass slide, microscope slide. So you can see two grids here. Now, this is an image, a mosaic, in fact, of a frozen grid that we were assessing. Uh, and uh, you can see the lattice, of, the lattice of the grid, as well as numbers and letters. Uh, and these are our guides in finding the same position again and again, because we need to, as we're translating the sample from one microscope to the other. Uh, a blow up of a specific region, you see here, uh, these are the cells, there's a good distribution of cells here, in this case it's HFF cells, and their fluorescence. Um, we don't have to do fluorescence microscopy, so samples can go straight into extra microscopy. And here I have a, an example of the good, the bad, and the bad, so the, although this is a well-preserved grid, there's only like one or two fibroblasts that you can see here. This is well prepared and you have a scattering of cells. Here, these are U2S cells. And this, this uh, grid, for example, is very heavily populated, most unlikely to generate good data because cells are grown over and uh, next to each other. All right, so um, the first modality that I wanted to show you was the cryosim, and this is the product of a successful collaboration between our team at Diamond and uh, Micron at the University of Oxford in the UK. The result was the cryosim, which is fully operational now. It's a super resolution fluorescence microscope accessible to our users, and it takes vitrified samples on grids, exactly what our samples are. Um, we use the full visible spectrum because we have four lasers, so any fluorophore, we can get some excitation out of it. We can uh, register two fluorescent signals at the same time, and we can see through um, heights of uh, 12 and above microns, so we can do set sampling throughout the sample, uh, throughout a cell easily. Uh, resolution to less than 100, and, well, 175 to less than 200 nanometers, and it's now fully commissioned. We also have cryodistome capability with much better resolution, but it's still under commissioning. And what I've shown you here is an example of a PS spec bit of 175 nanometers uh, fluorescing in green and how much better we can get the signal once we process it with cryosin. And again, the same thing in a cell, the specific cell you will see again. And you're looking at a cell where some of the vesicles are fluorescing red and uh, how it looks with conventional microscopy bright field, but also the fully processed cryosin. Um, this whole setup has been uh, reported in a recent Optica publication, as you can see here. All right, um, so at the cryosin, we normally start data collection with bright field, and I'm using one of the beamline projects and studying the cytoskeleton. Uh, so we're gonna see here, um, First is a bright field in this area. We're actually going through Z slices through a cell and we've gone through it and ended up on the support film which shows as a perforated film. Now these cells, as well as most mammalian cells, are not extremely photosynthetic under the white light. I'll show you again. So starting from the top, going through. Although you can see the general shape, they tend to be mostly transparent. Um, the data we collect, um, it looks a little bit like this, so we collect set slices and here you're going from the top of the cell, you collect several images in one slice, several images in the next, and what's lighting up in this case is uh, the F-actin, so we have fluorescent F-actin uh, constantly produced in these cells. The light that we supply has structure, you can see the lines here, and it's effectively the constructive interference between uh, the, these stripes and our fluorescent object that gives us the extra information in the resolution. Now, uh, if we were to look at the same sample in pseudo white field, so that's conventional um, fluorescence, you can see it's three dimensional, this is the cell, and you can see the cytoskeleton fluorescing red. Um, however, uh, and when we collect, I'm following the same, I'm trying to follow the same route. There you go, from the top of the cell through the cell all the way to the bottom. So what we did for bright field, I just did in conventional fluorescence. Now, when this is processed with cryosin, it looks a little bit like this. You see very clear separation of all the fluorescent centers. You can see the cytoskeleton very, very in a lot of detail. So this is what we gain with the cryosin, effectively taking us from a conventional to a high, high uh, information content. And then we can focus on specific areas. For example, here, let's say this was the area that we were interested in the filaments and the active filaments. 
And of course, this is entirely three dimensional. All right, and in this project, we were studying a number of mutations to try and see the effects, but in conventional uh, wild type cells, you can see the um, characteristic spread of the cytoskeleton, of the f actin cytoskeleton in the interface and mitosis. These are U2S cells, by the way. All right, so we'll move on to the next microscope and that's the soft X-ray uh, microscope. Uh, if you were to enter the x-ray side of the beam line, it looks a little bit like that. The microscope is at the far end, and these are the workstations that control it. If you were to turn around 180, you would see this, this area, which has changed slightly, but it's a fully fledged um, wet lab, category two wet lab here. Our beam line uh, gets light from a bending magnet. We have a single mirror toroidal mirror that focuses and directs light. We have a monochromator, but then the microscope itself itself has a typical components of any microscope, only it's uh, X-ray specific. We have a capillary condenser and a zone plate and a detector that collects the images. And here you can see the B24 team at the workstation that control the microscope. Um, so what is soft X-ray tomography? So it's an imaging technique, it's a 3D imaging technique. You get volumes of information and it, that allows us to see the ultrastructure of vitrified cells at near native state because we plunge freeze them. Uh, we use a uh, light at 500 electron uh, volt and this is about here what's called the water window where um, carbon rich biological matter absorbs x-rays heavily whereas oxygen rich me media that's surrounded do not so we get a very good absorption of biological matter from biological matter we use um, we collect till series so we do limited angle tomography and uh, we, get, we have optics for both 25 and 40 nanometers um, resolution. We can go through fairly thick samples. I mean, it's, uh, we don't have to be in a thin area like electron microscopy. Complementary, and we have several uh, upgrades uh, scheduled. So here you see again our microscope. As I said, this is the water window. And um, what you're seeing here is data from our student, uh, Kamal, uh, who's a joint student with Cambridge, with a group in Cambridge. And what you're looking at is uh, two cells. Uh, this is one nucleus here, this is another here, and uh, the cytoplasm of one of these cells. And within this nucleus, you can see quite a lot of spots. Uh, Kamal studies herpes virus, simplex virus one, and you can see all of these uh, are little uh, viral capsids. Uh, you can see all the little blebbing of the nucleus here and the cytoplasm. So this is the kind of information you can hope to achieve uh, by using X-ray tomography. All right, inside the microscope, uh, and I have to say that all of this is engaged in a metal box because uh, soft X-rays don't, don't travel well in air, so everything is under high vacuum and cooled via conduction, because remember our samples remain cold throughout this process. And you can see here, this is a sample holder, our optics, which in green, the green arrow points to the zone plate, the objective, and the pink arrow points to the capillary condenser. Uh, a side view of the same, the view is very is obstructed by cryo shields, but the light will come, come follows the yellow arrow direction. And we have uh, a capability for storage for four samples at a time. Now what's uh, time consuming with the extra microscope is putting the samples in and out. So by putting four, and remember each sample is a grid, which means that it has many areas to collect data from, uh, we save a lot of time. So I'm playing you a video now of the automation inside the microscope. Uh, we have a robotic arm that has just removed the shield of, of, of one of our sample holders and then the carousel will move back in again and the, the arm will take the sample holder here. Our sample is in this little dot here. Um, the carousel will leave and then the robotic arm will place the sample in the, the sample position which is exactly this one here. Uh, so we're fortunate we're benefiting from that so part of this is automated. All right, um, so what do we see at the water window? In this case, I've chosen, it's actually one of the grids from the same actin project. So we're looking at U2S cells. In fact, you're looking at three cells. There's one here, another here, neighbor here, another here, and another here. All the little spots are gold nanoparticles that we use for registration, image registration purposes. So all of these little spots are nanoparticles that are resting either on the surface or adjacent to the cells. So if we were to zoom in on one of these, and I need to point out here that this is a 2D mosaic. 
which means that our field of view in this case was 10 microns, 10 by 10 microns. Um, yeah, actually this, sorry, this bar, I was looking at this bar, this bar should be a little bit bigger. And the data that we collect here is about, it looks like this. These are projections as we tilt our sample with respect to the beam. And on each tilt angle, we collect a projection. So what you're looking is at the inside of the cell. This is the nucleus, the cytoplasm. You can see lipid droplets and quite a few nanoparticles here. Quite a lot of information in there. Now remember, this is the raw data hasn't been processed yet. Uh, so once this is done, we process the data. At the Binline, we use iMod currently, which is a standard sort of demography software. There's a number of other software packages that can be used. And what you'll see here is the tomogram of this area of the cell. As we go from the top through it, you'll see quite a lot of organelles, all the way to the carbon film, the perforated carbon film. So if we start it, starting from the top, you're seeing mitochondria, quite a lot of uh, endosomes, multivesicular bodies, uh, clearly delineated uh, endoplasmic reticulum. We've now reached the bottom. You can see the holes of the quantifoil. And then we're going back up again, um, lipid droplet and the nucleus here. So the amount of information you can collect from yourself is incredible. Uh, and a little bit or more obvious, I've, I've labeled a number of organelles here. So this is the sort of information we can get. And of course, it's three dimensional, which means that we can actually follow the shapes of mitochondria, the R contacts, and as well as the endosomal pathway. We have two facilities at the beam line, two setups at the beam line. We can use 25 nanometer resolution, which is fantastic resolution, but a very, very small uh, depth of focus and smaller field of view. Uh, but then we also have 40 nanometer resolution, which gives us a much bigger field of view, um, but also a greater depth of focus. So we can get uh, a lot more information with this one uh, at a small sacrifice in resolution. And here you're looking at the cell. It's from a similar population. It's from a different project, but it's also U2 I cells. You're looking at the nucleus here, uh, a big endolysosome, and then mitochondria, a lipid droplet, and other information. Okay, so correlating microscopy. So I've shown you two microscopes. The idea is that if you can bring these two together, you get a much more powerful microscope, a much more powerful uh, technique. So we do that by combining them and by using the same sample in different microscopes. And I'm gonna use here a recently published example from our beam line. Um, and uh, we looked at uh, tracking events, early events in the infection when it comes to real virus. We were using mammalian cells, we were using again U2 cells, it was entirely accidental, but it's the same cells as the actin project that we were looking at. And uh, real virus is a model of the virus. Um, it's a relatively, uh, uh, it's well used as a model and uh, it's not necessarily a, a horrible pathogen, although it has some pretty nasty relatives. Now, real virus uh, infects cells by, um, you know, more, more than likely clathrin dependent endocytosis, where it sits on the surface of the cell and gets endocytosed. It ends up in this little vesicle, which is fantastic because now it's inside the cell, but it's trapped within this vesicle. And uh, it was proposed that it's likely to be punching holes, whereupon uh, it releases core particles, you know, it, it manages to escape these vesicles and release core particles where they can go further and, and create progeny. So we were interested in tracking this uh, process and seeing when and how this happens. Does it affect the shape of the vesicles? So we used our platform and this is a graphical example of how we go from multiple fluorescence to bright field to X-ray all the way to producing a three-dimensional um, uh, correlative uh, imaging uh, volume. In this specific case, I'm showing you an example of one of the grids. You've seen it before. This was frozen well. And when we checked on the fluorescence, uh, I've, no, I've zoomed in on the cell that you've seen previously also. Um, I need to point out that this is a grid filled with cells that are all infected with real virus. And the real virus had been tagged with green fluorescence. Some of these, though, endogenously expressed fluorescent GAL3, which is an indicator molecule we used because it should normally be diffused in the, in the cytoplasm, but when uh, the vesicles that contain uh, viruses get uh, 
compromise, get uh, you know, start open breaking up. It gets the oh, it has the opportunity to swamp to, to quickly rush inside these vesicles and gets immobilized there. So it's a good indication indicator of uh, whether or not the vesicles that we're looking at have been somehow have their membrane somehow either with holes or has completely broken. So you're seeing this one uh, cell. Uh, expresses fluorescent uh, GAL3, and you can see that it's localized in these vesicles. So by this stage, the virus has certainly escaped these vesicles. All right, so we've done a series of tests, and this is one of many repeats, uh, where we looked at cells either as mock, mock infected, so no viruses, and then with viruses, one hour post-infection, two hours post-infection, four hours post-infection. In fact, we actually had three hours post-infection also. Now, all of this is, this, these events were expected to be happening sometime between the one hour and uh, three hours, uh, but we weren't sure. So um, you can see that as we track it, uh, real virus is fairly diffuse here, collecting sky fairly diffuse. But then after two hours, it's clear that uh, we find both green viral components as well as uh, gal in these vesicles. And by four hours, we see this massive uh, multivesicular bodies and late endosomes forming, so which means that the virus, the core particles have escaped, and any virus byproducts have now entered the um, either recycling or disposal route in the cells. Okay, so how we do this? Um, so you're looking here at an X-ray mosaic, and if you see here, you you see the little lines. Uh, effectively, what we do is because our field of view is so small, we translate the sample and grab a snap at each position, and then stitch it together to get a mosaic. This is one square of the uh, grid, and you can see one, two, three, four cells, perhaps more actually on the sides here, and a great big crack in the way that's a mechanical damage. It happens, but it doesn't actually detract from the information. What we do is we take the bright field data from the fluorescence microscope, and we use that to find our position where the two areas match, and then uh, we use the fluorescence we, bring, we use that as a guide to bring in the fluorescence. And now we know that we've collected data in this cell here, and this is how it superimposes with the fluorescence. Uh, remember, this is all in now starting. And then we go into 3D, where we superimpose the high resolution tomograms. So on each of these boxes, we've collected high content 3D data with using the x-rays. You can see here the nucleus, you can see the big um, late endosomal vesicle. And that means that if we focus in an area, let's say we're interested in this vesicle, based on this superposition, we now know that it's filled with GAL3, which means that at some point there was an escape of viral capsids, but also it's left with a number of viral byproducts, um, which means that are now have now entered its, the disposal route. Uh, this is information that neither of these techniques could provide us by itself, but once they're combined, it becomes much more uh, meaningful. So effectively, by correlating, not only are we looking at, here exam again, you're looking at a slice, a 2D slice from a tomogram of a cell. This is two hours post-infection, where we found loads of multivesicular bodies. In blue, we point to the nucleus, in green, the cytoplasm. Uh, and you see multivesicular bodies, as well as the areas where there's very, a lot of uh, very dark areas, meaning that there's a high content of carbon. So we see concentrations of carbon, very distinct features. I've marked with the yellow arrows the interface between two cells here. But when we superimpose the fluorescence, all these structures, like here, for example, become very meaningful because we know that these are uh, viruses or viral components. And of course, this is 3D, the same uh, information. This is from a four hour post infection. In fact, this one here is this vesicle here. So if you look at it, uh, we have now its shape delineated as well as its content in uh, viral components. So this is the type of information we gain. And uh, I wanted to show you by comparison, this is uh, this multivesicular body from two hours post-infection. And you're looking here at just the tomogram, as I said, high content from the top of the cell through the cells. And you can see there's a lot of information there, a lot of vesicles. However, when you combine this with fluorescence, and now we're going to look at the exact same thing. In fact, I'm going to bring this here and stop it. So we're looking at the exact same thing on the right, but this is now the correlation. So we're looking at x-ray with fluorescence. 
So all these vesicles that we see there now acquire meaning. I can easily tell you which of these vesicles contain viral components, which of these vesicles are structurally intact, and which of these vesicles have actually had pores punctured. We know it's probably pores because uh, vesicles retain their very rounded and nice shape. They don't just collapse as you would, you would see if they were completely ruptured. All right, so this is what we gained from using that. Um, so I'm going to wrap up by giving you a little bit of perspective. Our team is entirely interdisciplinary. You have biologists, physics, uh, chemists, and we benefit from interactions with engineers, optics, and synchro from radiation experts. We very much are entrenched in the development communities, both in X-ray microscopy as well as correlative schemes across the synchrotron itself, as well as super-resolution fluorescence. And we aim to uh, automate and improve data acquisition and processing. We're fully engaged with the research community. We have our own research projects and quite a lot of joint studentships. We do teaching and outreach activities. And our users tend to be academic users from around the world, uh, mostly UK and Europe, but also from other countries like, for example, the acting project that I showed you, so one of our collaborators with a collaborator in Japan. So we study from virus archaea all the way to cells, mammalian, insect, tissue sections, infections, cancer, processes that I've named a few, but really, Anything that requires imaging inside a cell or cell population, we can sort of address it. Uh, and always we aim to understand our target systems better. We are working on our workflows and we believe that we've reached good automation stages. We keep on trying to get it better. For example, X-ray data is automatically processed at the beam line, provided the sample is well fiducialized and we work towards uh, automating correlation now also. Uh, to access the facility that I've just shown you, um, we have uh, two routes. There's the standard access route, so groups are advised to get in touch with us, discuss projects, accessibility needs, and then they apply through a peer review um, um, process. If the project is relevant, well thought of, and likely to um, have an impact one way or another, then it gets you know, allocated time. And there's also rapid access for B24, which means if a project is just starting and so the, the researchers just wants to see if it would be suitable for these methods, they get in touch with us and we give uh, short shifts just to try and assess feasibility. Um, Acknowledgement. So I'll start by saying uh, if you go to our website, you find all our information. Here's our website. And we have a, uh, well, the acknowledgement list, by the way, I will start by saying it's woefully minimal here. In fact, there's a huge number of people at Diamond and, abroad and outside Diamond that have helped, but I, you know, this is to mention a few from Diamond Light Source, certainly the international synchrotron community, both at Bessie and Alba, um, RB24 users, and I'm mentioning uh, Professor Robinson's group because I've used his data, and then uh, software development, both on-site and uh, from micro, but as well from Europe. Um, the UK Youth Fluorescence Microscopy Community, Zeiss X Radio, a former X Radio, have helped us a lot. But to be quite honest, this whole thing is uh, based on uh, a wonderful user community. People have put up with a lot, helped us develop, gave us direction, um, used our, our facility. So, really, ultimately, it's the user community that has shaped this being mine. And uh, I'll leave you with our contacts. Uh, we're all you available to, to talk. Uh, this is us again, our emails. Uh, we have a, a Twitter feed, so we try to keep our community updated. Our research, recent research highlights. And um, this is it. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>